Okay, I'm ready. How are you today? You, you look better. I must say that <laughs> Labor Day weekend made you tired. I could see that. Now you're back to your usual talkative selves, right? Bright, focused, going straight to your destination. Today I'm going to review with you a few announcements then I will introduce the themes, the general themes of the short stories by Charles Loomis that were published first on a variety of magazines and then later on they were published in, they were collected in this small book that I have a copy of in my collection of automotive literature. If there is time, we will also read a few passages. You must have noticed that inside the readings, there are a few passages that were highlighted. And of course, that indicates some relevance. Then I will briefly introduce the movie of today, which is Bumblebee, and we'll watch a few scenes from it. Before I start with the published announcements, I just want to remind you that I spent the whole morning correcting assignments. And so at this point, the majority of the assignments have been reviewed, graded, and you should be able to find comments also inside your Google Docs files. Again, the majority means a little more than half. I still have about a dozen to review and grade, which I'm planning to do possibly by tomorrow, okay? If any of my comments is too short or even curt, too blunt, you can ask me to explain if in spite of the comment you still don't understand the rationale for the grade or would like to have more assistance with homework, just let me know. You can leave a comment yourself inside the Google Docs file or you can schedule an appointment with me or you can approach me after the class. Of course, since the deadlines of both assignments were passed, for those students whose assignments I reviewed, I did everything, both the first and the second assignment, okay? And you know that there is no assignment, no written assignment due next week. If you haven't completed the assignments, let me know, explain what happened, and you can still submit the assignments. But if you need assistance, if what blocked you was that you were kind of lost that the instructions were not completely clear, come and see me on Zoom, okay? Or, or contact me otherwise. I posted a few announcements just for your curiosity. Every year in California, uh, around the, the middle of August, there are the best, some of the best historic races at the Laguna Seca racetrack, which we saw on Tuesday Herbie went there as well and won there as well. Um, and simultaneously, around the same time, uh, between, in, in the Monterey Peninsula, in the vicinity of the south of San Francisco, not too far from the racetrack, between the racetrack and the, and the ocean, they organized a few gatherings for uh, uh, vintage car collectors. These are very highbrow events. I don't know what the current price for ticket is, but 10 years ago was already about $100, right? They, they don't want the populace to, to, to be there, but then of course you will find their actors or you will find Wayne Carini or Jay Leno, uh, et cetera, the usual suspects. Since they bring together all of these collectors, 
they also hold auctions. This is not uncommon even for, for local events. For example, if you, if you ever contemplate going to Greenwich, Connecticut in June, they have the Concours d'Elegance, which is a pretty nice event. And every year they also have auctions, items for auctions. And given the level of these events, usually in California in August, they uh, bid for big sums of money for uh, very fancy cars. This year, in spite of the numbers, because they made uh, $239 million altogether from these auctions, those numbers, the, the single numbers for specific cars were lower than usual, believe it or not. In any case, you find here some example. The car you saw is a uh, beautiful uh, exemplar of the Liberty style of the 1930s. This Bugatti Type 57 Atalanta sold for more than 10 million. And next to it, you see a, a much cheaper Ferrari 400 that went for six million, etc. The star this year was this Ferrari 410, bodied by Scaglietti. Scaglietti was a body maker. Often Ferrari didn't do, during this period, uh, the bodies of the cars themselves. And keep in mind that even Scaglietti, the, the workers of, of Scaglietti, to make this car, they used limited machinery. They mostly did it by hand, by hand right? So normally they would create a wooden model and if you go to Maranello to the Galleria Ferrari Museum near the factory you can still see some of this wooden model shaped like the car should be and then they took a piece of aluminum they first molded it by just by looking at it in the general shape that this part of the car should eventually have and then when they thought they were close enough roughly close, they would put it on the model and continue with the Hummer until uh, the shape was perfect. But, but of course, uh, it's not a, a, a work that requires muscle. You, you, need, you do need a lot of care, right? In order to bend the, the metal, aluminum is pretty pliable, but you want it to be smooth, right? So uh, this particular car, sold for more than $22 million. And um, inside the engine, if you go see at the pictures offered by Sotheby, uh, which was taking care of the auction of the, the sale of this car on the engine, you can see in with, with a marker, the writing inscribed by Carol Shelby saying, Enzo Ferrari told me that this was the most beautiful Ferrari ever built. But then this was Carol Shelby who would often approach customers and say, let me sign the dashboard of your Shelby Cobra, it'll be worth more. So, not saying he was uh, completely dishonest, but he, he was a character. Um, one of the videos that you could pick from for the second assignment was about the Ford F50 Lightning, the electric pickup, the electric version of the very popular F50, reviewed by uh, Marcus Brownlee. In fact, that was his first review without the driving experience because he wasn't allowed at that time. And he then added more reviews, one recent, a uh, couple of months ago, which is interesting. He compares the Ford 150 to the iPhone in terms of usability. He likes it, he bought one, even though he had left a deposit for the Cybertruck by Tesla, which is not coming. Uh, and, uh, and for the video, they used two. So they had one, their production vehicle uh, that they own, and another to shoot the video, to shoot the part where they're driving it. And since at this point, Marcus put together about a dozen videos about cars, especially electric cars, he decided uh, at the end of August to launch his new channel, which is Autofocus. Videos will be published, I think, on both his regular channel, where he's talking about technology, phones, computers, etc. And also inside this 
a separate YouTube channel where right now you find only two videos. So I added all the links in case you're interested. Uh, I don't know if you follow Marcus uh, when you're looking for a new phone or a digital watch or anything else, right? Um, I, I like this review he posted recently of the Ionic 5 where even if you watch just the first few minutes, he talks about the criteria that would make an electric vehicle successful. It has to be good, of course, it has to be affordable. And he reminds you that it was during one of his interviews of Elon Musk that asked by Marcus Elon Musk if, whether he would ever see, we would ever see a $25,000 electric vehicle, Elon Musk said, absolutely. And this was, was of course, uh, covered by the media. A lot of media outlets uh, uh, reproposed this statement. Uh, and we know that it didn't happen. It's not going to happen. There is no indication that Tesla would be, would be able to, to offer for real a, a, a car that is less than 40,000. I mean, for real, not one of those market employees whereby starting from does not include the wheels, the seats, mm -hmm. etc. And he insists also quite correctly about storage, right? Because once you have a car that doesn't need as much space devoted to the mechanics, right? You don't need to have one of these big engines that you find inside an SUV or a pickup truck, then what are you going to do with the space that's left? Can you be more creative, right? And in, 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 refer, in reference to that, he doesn't really like the Ionic that much because inside the trunk, the front trunk, there is just a basic compartment you could put a small bag there, but if you watch the latest video about the Ford 150, he likes the front of the the front trunk of the Ford 150 a lot. I think it, the capacity is 400 or 500 liters, and the fact that you have all these plugs inside, so you could actually work. You could actually turn the front trunk into a working station if you're a worker. So it, it seems practical. He does uh, praise the uh, fact that they've uh, expanded the space of the interior as much as possible, given that uh, they didn't have to reserve as much space to the engine. And, and the car is also slightly wider than a regular car. Um, I, I didn't see until yesterday that last week he posted a video which is his second on this particular car about the 2022 electric Hummer. Believe it or not, there is an electric Hummer and it weighs, what, 9,000 pounds, roughly, okay? And, and of course, it has a ridiculous amount of batteries to move it and give it a range of 300 miles. Since last week we talked about the uh, history of the automobile, I thought I would uh, post this article that came out in the last issue of AAA Today, the, issue, the magazine of the Automobile Club, which, which I get, of course, and I embedded it uh, in, in here, inside the page. Again, just for your curiosity. Uh, I had one more announcement that I will post next week because actually during Labor Day weekend, I did go to Lime Rock, Connecticut for the 40th Historic Festival. Took more than 800 pictures, and I'm still going through the pictures, and I'll select a few just to give you an idea of the scene when you go to these events. The kind of cars, the kind of people, what is going on, etc. That was it. So, this is a separate presentation with some notes and it's especially useful, this page, for the images that give you a sense of the vehicles described, narrated in the short story by Loomis. So first of all, 
Charles Loomis was a Brooklyn, Brooklynite, was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1861, died at a relatively young age in 1911, at age 50, uh, from, from illness. And although he attended a technical school, he went to the Polytechnic in Brooklyn, which is now an engineering school, um, he became a journalist and a writer. Keep in mind that, especially from the, the 1890s on, and then up until the 1930s, in the um, market for, for publishing and publishing fiction, it was really possible at that time to make a living writing short stories. Because people, by the 1890s, people in the US, people in Great Britain, other European countries as well, were buying a lot of magazines, were spending a lot of time reading, believe it or not. And uh, magazines with pictures came out and were very popular, and illustrations as well. And oftentimes, these magazines would publish entire novels in installments, right? You would follow the various episodes from issue to issue. This is true of two of the readings we will make, both the novel entitled The Lightning Conductor from 1902 and the other one entitled A Motor Car Divorce from 1906, both written by women, Alice Williamson, Williams and uh, Louise, uh, Louise Closser Hale, were first published inside magazines and then the various episodes were collected in a published novel. Um, so, Loomis would write and publish short stories on a regular basis, and then every other year or so, he would collect the best of his short stories in books which were usually bigger than this one. The reason why this was smaller is that he collected in here the only three short stories he had about the automobile. And the reason why the first short story was published in 1900, but this is from what, 1907? Yes. 1907 is exactly that. 1907 is the year when everything comes together. When the automobile is on the verge of transitioning from an exotic, unreliable toy for wealthy people into a more desirable item and product. So given that around 1907 the car is fashionable more than it used to be seven years before, uh, someone, either he or his agent, uh, got the idea of republishing these novels, these short stories. Uh, the only ones about the automobile, but he writes a lot about American society, American customs, even about being on the road uh, and transportation in, in, in different fashions. There is another very interesting story in one of his collections about a gentleman, kind of an upper uh, class uh, guy who is riding his carriage drawn by a horse going home to see his family after a trip and he sees by the side of the road someone who is asking for a ride so hitchhiking was a thing even before cars in fact if anything people felt more compelled to give a ride to someone on the road when uh, there were carriages, then later on with automobiles, okay? So the entire short story in this case is all about manners. So this guy wants to go home, doesn't want to waste any time. He knows that the horse will be slower with another passenger on board. He knows that he might have to engage in a conversation and doesn't want to, but is a member of the upper classes, manners are important to people like him, so he lets the guy on. And because of the impositions of good manners, not to renounce on his good image, the guy will end up being invited at the first gentleman's house, will remain there for tea, will go out for a walk with uh, him and his daughters 
will befriend one of the daughters, and within 24 hours, the guy who is kind of obnoxious and, and kind of insistent will end up being engaged to the gentleman's daughter. Mind you, the daughter is more than willing, the daughter who, of course, like a young woman of the period has been kept in the house, cannot see any man, and finally a man shows up and is good enough, and, and she falls in love quickly. And the protagonist doesn't want to, but it would be rude to say no at any point from the first ride to the engagement, it would be rude to say no. And technology appears in the story when in order to uh, vouch for his reputation, the hitchhiker makes a phone call to the governor's house and the governor talks to the gentleman confirming that this hitchhiker is a, a person of good repute, okay? But again, the gentleman, every instinct in his, every fiber in his body tells him that this is not a good thing, not good for him, not good for the daughter, but good manners ahead of everything. So, the stories, let me, first, first I should summarize these stories, right? So the first one you find there is Araminta and her husband. All the stories have the automobile at the very center of the narrative. In the first two stories, Araminta and her husband, and Martha and John, we're talking about people who are buying their first car. The last story takes place in New York City, and it's about someone taking a taxi cab, an electric taxi cab. Okay. and their experiences with their first drive, essentially. Okay, so it, it is the encounter with the technology that you find at the core of these short stories, and that's why they're so interesting to us. They're easy readings, of course. They're not complex narratives or complex characters. It's mostly about the situation. It's mostly about the light tone and the style. So. In the first story, a man who is living in the suburbs and commuting to the city and not happy about having either to chat with other commuters, play cards with them, or reading the newspapers, would rather be alone on the road, decides to buy an automobile. From the very beginning, we know that he's the first one in the neighborhood that he lives in a place where people don't have cars, people rely on horses, and people will look at him weirdly, but this is also a matter of pride, right? I'll be the first one. I'll, I'll be different, I'll elevate my social status, that's the implied message. So he buys a car, the guy, the car, this following the customs of the period, the car is delivered to him, right? Because what happens in 1900, when you want to buy a car, you go to a salon, to a dealership, and you'll find there salesmen who are also drivers. They'll take you around in demo cars. And people will complain during this period about the fact that the demo cars are always working and comfortable. But the real cars have a lot of issues, they're not as comfortable, etc. So they give you a ride, and if you like the car, then, before you can take the car home, or before you can have it delivered, you need to learn how to drive. So the dealership will take care of that. So the gentleman who's driving you around and selling you the car will also give you a quick lesson, right? An hour or two. The same happens in this short story. The guy comes to deliver the car and says, I'm here to show you how it works, however, the owner refuses. And if you look at the illustration from the book, you get the context. You get why this is going on. Oh, the illustration is not here. Find it.
There we are. So this gentleman to your left is the buyer. The protagonist, the unnamed husband of the story. Next to him is the guy who delivers the car and who's supposed to teach him how to drive. And what's apparent both from the clothes and also from the face, the grin, the uh, vulgar scratching under the nose, that there is a class difference between these two. And therefore you understand that one of the reasons why the buyer will refuse is that he cannot stand someone from a lower class to teach him about the car. Let me see if the car is represented. There it is. The car is at the bottom of the illustration. Okay, so the theme here, the idea is that I'm intellectually better endowed. I'm brighter, I'm richer, I understand more of the world. Why should I be taught by you? And in other ways, this theme will reappear in the literature about the automobile, but from the opposite point of view. That is to say, exactly that. People from the lower classes who are technologically savvy, who know how to drive, get themselves elevated in society. Or the fact that we'll see uh, sonnets, poems devoted to the, uh, to the character of the chauffeur, to the idea that a chauffeur is very much in demand and therefore can request to be treated by their owners in a prince-like fashion, to the point that one of those sonnets is the story of someone who was studying to become a doctor and then decided to become a chauffeur, okay? So that's how chauffeurs were placed in the uh, mind of the people looking at this transition into a society relying heavily on the automobile. So the guy refuses any help and then, of course, wants to try the car and tells his wife, Araminta, and this is one of many women that you will see has a more skeptical, more ironic posture in her relationship with the husband, to go around, and in the process of taking the car out, even before the wife can jump on the car, he starts destroying the house, which is very symbolic, right? The house, the opposite of mobility, the fixed place being destroyed, by the car, start taking the veranda apart, start destroying the fence, the barn, etc. The wife jumps in, they manage to get out of the lawn and into these rural streets. Remember, these are the rural suburbs, right? No highway during this period yet. That will be introduced by Vanderbilt later on in that decade on Long Island, the highway, the Long Island Expressway. And on the street, they encounter the doctor, they encounter other people, and of course they manage to scare everyone. They have an accident with the doctor. The doctor, who was riding on his cart, right? Doctors in rural area would have a horse and cart to travel and go and see their patients. And later on, cars would be heavily advertised to doctors, saying you can see more patients using a car, right? If you have a practice outside of an urban area. So the doctor ends up on the car itself, right? Uh, because they destroy his car and the doctor has to jump on, on the car and becomes a passenger for a little while and then he has to jump off, he cannot hold on. And, and the, the, the line in this case is that the, the husband will, will switch to homeopathic treatments because he cannot see the doctor anymore. And the entire short story, like in some ways the other stories are about the inability to control the technology, about this technology, this new technology, the automobile, that captures you. It captures your imagination, right? You cannot imagine your life without it. So from the very beginning, you have this association, car, technology, and lifestyle, right? It's not that I need it for some utilitarian reason. I want it because my life will be different. That's the assumption, right? Which is true to this day, even for smartphones, for example, and other electronic devices. 
And so you are different. Your old self cannot control the car. So you have to change yourself, modify your identity, of course, acquire special skills in order to control the automobile. Overall, Loomis's view of the technology is ironically negative, right? It doesn't really have a positive message. He emphasizes how unreliable, difficult to control, uh, the cars are in all three of these stories. The second story, let me show you, illustrate it with another image. Has to do with something very similar to this invention but that was patented during that period. This is supposed to be a carriage, of course, many of the Initial models of cars were just chassis of traditional carriages with engines in placed in the back, back usually, or underneath, in this case, in the back. And someone had the idea to add the torso and the head of a horse, thinking people are scared of automobile, so psychologically it would be a good thing if they, their mind can be put at ease, reassured, because what they see in front of them is what they would have seen until the moment they switched from a carriage and horse to an automobile. Okay, so believe it or not, marketing was, was king during this period for this kind of product. So the second story is about another couple. She's named Martha and his name to uh, what? What's the name of the guy in the second story? Have it somewhere here. John. Yeah. So John is rich. Again, wealthy customers, right? Cars from the 1900 often are as expensive as a small apartment or a small house. So rich guy with a suburban villa with servants, with several carriages, more than one, and horses. But he wants to have the car. It's the newest thing. He wants to try it. He's desperate to, however, he knows his wife, Martha, is partial to horses. And she would not accept this diabolical contraption. And, and therefore John postpones his plans to get an automobile until the time would be right to have her wife's agreement. Which is interesting because one of the themes in these stories and other books we'll read from is consumerism. So how do you relate the family to the consumerist market? For big purchases such as a house or an automobile, which is as expensive as a house, do you need the entire family to agree? And of course, in the ideology of, of pure consumerism, you need to break the bonds between husband and wife. You need to break the bonds in the family. You, you need to have as many buyers as possible, not just both agreeing. You need to sell one car to the husband, one to the wife. So John is, is sad, dejected, doesn't think he'll ever be able to buy a car, however something happens. His wife goes out for a walk and she comes in contact with some poison oak and she touches her eyes, so her eyes are, are swollen, irritated, and the doctor says, in order to rest those eyes, you have to wear goggles with very dark lenses so that the light will not come in and disturb the eyes that are recovering from this poison ivy or poison oak irritation. So John sees the moment, seizes the moment. He goes to the city, New York, and he buys a special car, a car that can be driven from behind. And this is, seems strange, but it was not unusual because this happened a lot. You see one here, for example. This is the taxi cab from the third and last 
story. The driver is here, right? Because this is fashioned after the hansom cab where the horse will be in front and uh, the reins will come over the top. The customers, the passengers will be in front and join the view and the driver would be in the back. But this kind of model was replicated several times during that period. This is the actual picture of a similar taxi cab with the driver on top. This is yet another one. And again, it's shaped like very much like a traditional carriage. There is rubber on the wheels, not just wood. And you see on top the driver with the lever to steer this vehicle. And the passengers would be let in here. And then you see the, uh, the uh, driver would step on. There are steps to help him up there. Here, another example. This has a real steering wheel, but again, it's in the back, right? And the front and everything else is shaped like a carriage. This is a Victoria. I believe these things were very popular for a short while. This is another example. This is yet another example, but in this case, the driver is in front. So, he buys this uh, uh, special car and he has it modified in the same way you saw earlier. He has a fake horse, not just part of a horse, but an entire horse attached with poles to the front of this car. But then he also needs sound, right? Special effects. So he uses the technology of sound. By this time, you had gramophone and other recording devices. So he has a machine that reproduces the sound of a horse. And he hires a driver because he cannot drive himself. He has everything brought up to his villa. And one day he tells his wife, come, we'll go for a ride. I'm giving you as a gift a new carriage. She cannot see, she, she can see the shapes, right? So she can see the horse, the shape of the horse, the shape of the carriage. She can see that there is a driver, although she recognizes from the voice that it's not their usual driver. And he says, no, this is someone else. They start to go out, of course, Things go well enough. Initially, the wife says, oh, the, this, this horse is very quick, but also very well, well balanced because she can feel that the ride is very smooth. She's uh, struck by the particular detail that the sound of the hoofs doesn't change, whereby the varied speed of a horse would be matched by different sounds, and he said, well, this, this, this horse is very well trained, so can maintain the same kind of trot in speed uh, at all times. By the end of the story, everything comes crashing. So they have an accident, the machine is crashed, the wife is thrown out of the carriage, and the husband tells, so the, the whole contraption, the fake horse is crashed, not the car, the car is not totaled. And so the husband goes to the hired driver who comes from the dealership and says, okay, bring it back to the dealership. We're not going to buy this car after all. But he speaks to the wife who has not yet realized she was on an automobile and she says, I thought horses were safer, but probably we should get a car after an accident such as this. So the man calls back the driver and they'll go on at some point. He will reveal uh, possibly the, uh, what, what happened, but they go on to become a new couple, a technological couple that has a car. The last story has to do with this illustration. There it is. This is from the magazine 
not from the book. You have other illustrations in the book. In this story, you have a couple that is not yet engaged, but getting closer, progressing towards that kind of proposal. Orville is a writer, someone who became successful with a recent bestseller, uh, Philosophy for Non-Thinkers, something like that, some kind of self-help book that were popular during that period as well. And he is kind of a mature age. It's time for him to get settled. And it just so happened that there is a woman visiting her aunt who is in town from the Midwest, Annette. And, and she's younger, she's bright, uh, she comes from a good family, and, and she seems to be the right kind of fiance and then bride for him. It is Christmas, and he is informed that Annette, the day after Christmas, will leave New York City to go to Paris for a trip to visit another relative. And of course, uh, he gets into his mind that young woman, beautiful from a good family, she goes out in the world, she'll probably be proposed before the end of her Paris vacation. So he has to make a move. So he goes out, there is a dinner, he's invited to a Christmas dinner, he'll propose after the dinner, and he goes out, buys a ring, and then goes home to get ready. However, his lips falls, and you see in that corner, you have a shoe and a slipper. That's the reason why you, you see those, is that a key passage in the story is that Orville has a foot that is so swollen that he cannot wear two shoes. He has to wear a ridiculous flowered uh, slipper uh, and a regular shoe. And that's also the reason why he cannot walk to uh, the dinner in the upper part of Manhattan. And he has to call a taxi cab. Electric taxi cabs were very popular during that period you can find a link and some information. New York City had hundreds of such taxi cabs that were very well organized because the ele electric transportation as a technology was very developed initially. For example, since there were taxi cabs and the range was a bit limited for those vehicles in spite of the dimensions of the batteries, they would go back to the hub, to the central hub, and simply take the battery out and replace it instead of recharging it attached to the vehicle so that these taxi cabs could go, uh, could go uh, the whole day. So he takes this electric ta taxi cab and you see of course Cupid, the angel of love uh, in, in the back, the, the winged uh, creature of Venus because the taxi cab will, will facilitate the proposal in the end. However, it becomes a problem. When they arrive at their destination in front of the house where the dinner takes place, this posh mansion uh, in Upper Manhattan, uh, the cab can stop, cannot come to a stop. Something is wrong inside and the driver says, I'm sorry, the only thing we can do is drive around until we run out of charge. And I know that he says, I know this vehicle has been used for a while, so it won't take long before we run out of battery. Brakes, of course, were finicky and, and unreliable, under dimensions, dimensioned usually for the weight of these vehicles. So you can expect them to fail. And don't forget, Orville has a, an injured foot, so he cannot jump out because clearly, this kind of vehicle would be driving around New York at around 12 miles per hour, right? Not very quick, but he cannot jump. He would like to jump, but the driver says, no, 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 I don't want the liability. I don't want to be sued if, if you break your leg, which is already injured. So they go around the same block, and Orville is late. And the guests are wondering, including Annette, where he is. One of the guests, Joe Barton, has this, nice piece 
tirade against technology, saying, oh, something must have happened to this guy. Because technologies today, they're all dangerous. The elevator is dangerous. The automobile is dangerous. The train is dangerous. The steamboats are dangerous. Meaning, we don't really gain anything from this technology, technologies compared to the past, other than we added more risks and dangers to our lives. So everyone is getting tense because Orville is pretty punctual, usually on time, and it's not coming. Meanwhile, Orville, every time with, the, with this thing, and he's in the front, every time he comes around, he is, there it is, he is screaming, he's shouting to alert the guests and, and the hosts that he's there of, of this situation. Well, it's, it's a whole scene, kids are running after them. Again, remember 12 miles, so they're not so fast. Finally, the guests are alerted, realize what is going on. They see the car going around, they see it a second time and they know he's inside, so they're trying to do something. This is Joe Barton, the same guy who was decrying the ills of technologies, who's jumping on board to bring him some food. Okay, so that's the first thing. And, and to see what can be done. So he has two good legs, he can jump, and he manages then the next time around to get off. And then Annette gets on the car. She jumps on the car, and of course, before the taxi cab will come to a halt, running out of electricity, he proposes, she accepts, and of course, you see her uh, like a, a Renaissance, shy, aristocratic woman, but in fact, when you read the description of Annette, you see that, that she's the prototype of the new woman, where new woman, the new woman movement was then the label of the feminist movement. Because there are some subtle hints that the readers of the time would have caught that Annette is a, a proper woman to a degree, that she's a bit rough, which is blamed on her being a Midwestern meaning that, that she is stronger as a woman that you would expect, okay? And so he proposes, she accepts, and they will both go to Paris for their honeymoon as soon as he recovers. So another story about the automobile holding hostage of their occupants, right? Being kidnapped by the technology will be a theme in the literature from the period we will see next week with Jules Verne and the master of the universe. Because once you are kidnapped, unintentionally in this case, or as a result of malicious actions in the case of Jules Verne, then you are forced to experience the technology. Then you are exposed to the technology. And you have this idea that the forced proximity with the car will change you and will change your approach, your relationship with the technology itself. So even in this case, if you look at the pictures, you can see the kind of vehicle that they're referring to and how you can step on it, how two people can sit in front and the driver in the back. And in the case of an electric taxi, in here you would have found the batteries and the electrical engine. And this is exactly the, the, the one that you find represented in the magazine that I showed you before. And of course, there is another page where you find all of the stories. Now, before we proceed with the film, are there any questions, any comments? I don't know if you had a chance to read the short stories and you have questions on passages that I didn't expand on today or comments on aspects of these stories that uh, were, were not analyzed 
during this presentation. Yes, please. Yes, as, as, as you find it mentioned in one of the presentations about the history of the automobile, the one called the future of the automobile, during some years in the first 10 or 15 years of the 20th century, the distribution in terms of sale was almost equal between steam cars, electric cars, and internal combustion engines. And marketing was much stronger initially, especially around the year 1900, at some stronger points for electric cars. For example, women can drive it, can drive an electric car better because if they don't have to crank it, which require not just strength, but more than anything, dexterity in order not to be injured. Uh, and therefore, the electric car was the ideal vehicle that was being sold to women, to doctors, to professionals, even to older women. And they remained popular for a while until the 1920s. It was during the 1920s that that part of the industry, both the steam cars and the electric cars, died for lack of innovation, while at the same time, the, well, like lack of affordable innovations, while at the same time, uh, internal combustion engine cars were becoming cheaper and cheaper. Right, because in terms of innovation, if you've seen the Jay Leno video about the Owen magnetic, you see how powerful the thinking behind that, uh, the engineering of the car was, right? Yeah, I was going to ask, was that innovation in terms of infrastructure, like charging stations? No, you would have to recharge at home. For companies with a fleet of cars, then they could have their own garages where their cars could stop and replace the batteries, which was very ingenious. Otherwise, people would uh, charge it at home like most people do nowadays, right? I have a charger in my garage, because it's not like, well, the university has a few pumps, although they're not free, mind you. <laughs> but uh, really, the most convenient thing is to put the pump in in the evening, and in the morning, you find it charged. Right, and the evening is better also because of temperatures. Because if you want to take care of your electrical batteries in your EV, you have to uh, be careful about temperatures. So you don't want to recharge the batteries when it's too hot or too cold. You don't want to leave those vehicles outside when it's minus 10 or extreme cold temperatures because the chemicals in the batteries will eventually become less efficient. Yes? I have another question. What has changed in the past 100 years? Right now, electric cars are in the future. It was simply, it was, well, some companies tried it, right? Honda tried it in the 1980s and 90s with some prototypes. Other companies did it, but mostly for show. At least Honda sold a few cars, and one or two of them were sold on Long Island, and the last time I saw one of them was probably a few years ago. So someone has had those initial home electric Hondas from the 1990s for, for, for at least 20 years. But, but then it was mostly uh, Elon Musk, right? He was the Marconi of, of the situation, the, 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 the bright inventor or the Edison of the situation. I use Marconi because I'm Italian, but that kind of inventor's mind who can see the possibility, right? of this new technology. And keep in mind that because of economic reasons, competition was being stifled within the industry to the point that past the 1960s, there are no competitors. You can go back to Tucker, right? There is even a movie with Jeff Bridges about Tucker's failure, uh, the failure of the Tucker torpedo in the 1940s, which was a little bit newer was not even dramatically new, but the big companies crashed in, right? Because they had the, the means, same as it might happen with Microsoft or Google buying a startup just to kill the product, or even by an industry, right? Microsoft bought uh, Nokia and, and killed it. Uh, came back later, but n not as big as it was, especially in Europe, uh, et cetera, et, et cetera. So, 
there was no space for any serious competitors. Not a small company, right? You could always create a company and produce 10 cars a year because you would need a small shop. But as far as producing 1,000 or 10,000, te uh, the Tesla and Elon Musk were, were the first to manage to become a new players at that point and forced the others to compete with him. Otherwise, Ford, Chrysler, etc., would not be there uh, uh, producing electric cars if it weren't first for Tesla and now, of course, the governmental impositions to switch production from internal combustion engines to electric engines. Okay? I'll, we'll stop the conversation here because I want to briefly introduce the film. We're talking about Bumblebee in the series called The Transformers. At the beginning of this movie, uh, the Transformers who are droids, living robots, uh, are being attacked in their planet and are being forced to go into exile, to abandon their planet in order to avoid being enslaved. One of them, who's not really a big feisty warrior, Bumblebee, is sent to Earth to explore and see if Earth can become a hideout for the other Transformers. The Transformers are the good guys, the Decepticons are the bad guys. Of course, uh, once uh, Bumblebee gets to Earth, one of the Decepticons intercepts him, and Bumblebee is wounded, is able to change to morph, right? These droids are able to uh, stare at an inanimate object and change into it with the last few resources before the battery runs out, with broken chips, including the broken voice synthesizer. Uh, Bumblebee she looks at a Volkswagen Beetle, yellow Volkswagen Beetle, and transforms into it. Years later, this Volkswagen Beetle is parked at a garage, completely abandoned, and will be purchased, and actually it will be given to her by a, an American female teenage high schooler uh, by the name of Charlie. And so we'll see Charlie coming into contact with this car and then strike a relationship with the car. Keep in mind, from the point of view of the visual style of the story, the story insists a lot <coughs> on seeing and being seen through mirrors or seeing inside the car where you can see also, depending on where you watch, Bumblebee's eyes, because he has, of course, robotic eyes, and he can transform whenever he wants, once his strength is restored from a car to a human humanoid robot. The protagonist, Chadley, is someone who's not being seen by her family. She's a teenager, and therefore she was on the verge of building her own new self as an adult. During this period, which is a key period for anyone, his father, her father dies. And with her father, she was working on the restoration of an old Corvette from the 1960s. And this project would be abandoned. She will not be able to complete the project the same way that she's not able to complete her transformation in an adult self who is recognized by others. Because whenever she goes into the kitchen, we'll see her waking up and going to the kitchen, what her mother and her stepfather see is not who she really is. And, and they try to change her according to their own models. When she goes to school, when she goes to work, no one sees her as someone who's valuable, who's relevant, right? They see her as a loser inside. And Bumblebee is himself living at the margins, right? He's in exile in a planet that is not his planet. He's wounded, cannot talk. He's on the run. He could be killed, destroyed by these Decepticons. He found out. Then also the government, the American government, John Cena is a member of the military, who's trying to capture this technology to turn it into some kind of weapon. So even Bumblebee is frail, weak, marginalized, and, and therefore they see each other. 
she finally sees for who, him for who she who he is and, and vice versa and by the end of the story of course we'll see her empowered with a more secure persona public identity driving her car that she will finally restore but now we see just the beginning this is after a fight with the American military and also the Decepticon who's trying to destroy Bumblebee. 